Hi, my name is Jermaine Boyd, creator of the Amelia Sky series and various other comic books, uh, Multi-D, The Remains. Um, I'm promoting my Kickstarter for Amelia Sky issue four, October 10th. And uh, you're watching and listening to Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined today by a very talented comic creator. We are supposed to have both the writer and the artist on the show, but we have the writer, which is just as good. And we are joined by this creative person talking about an amazing new comic that I just happened upon called Amelia Sky. We're joined by the ever-talented Jermaine M. Boyd. How are you doing today? I'm doing fine about you. I'm doing good, doing good. For those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person, tell us who you are and what you're bringing to Two Geeks Talking. Well, I am actually a Midwestern boy. I'm living here in Louisiana right now. Um, I went to school at Columbia for film and television, uh, also Academy of Art University. It's in San Francisco. Uh, I primarily want to do writing, but my degree is in directing. I want to be able to bring more animation to the table, and that's kind of what my forte is, but comic books is a baseline for me, and I, I want to be able to create stories in the comic book world as well. So then what is Amelia Sky all about? Uh, Amelia Sky is something I created in college a long time ago, <laughs> unfortunately. I, it's, uh, it's about a little girl. She's about 12, and she wakes up in the middle of an apocalypse. Well, I guess you would say after the apocalypse, post-apocalypse. She wakes up with no identity of who she is, and she's discovering who she is along the way. And she tries to find herself and the people that she meets along the way, along her journey. Um, little by little, you'll start to find out who she is and she'll start to find out who she is. You want to be able to, well, I want to be able to have the audience find out as the story goes along. That's, that's good. That was the one thing I, I noticed about the, the comic itself from what I got to read here. Obviously, you have a Kickstarter campaign as well, too. We'll get into that as, <laughs> as well, obviously, because that's an important part about getting this published, too. The art style is really beautiful. I mean, there's a little bit of a glimpse of it in the title image in the lower third there here. Who is the team with yourself in terms of this particular comic, and, and how did you find them? Martina, I originally had an artist. Her name was Gwen Torres, and uh, she was here in America. Unfortunately, she went into retirement, and that sparked me to find someone else, and I found uh, an amazing upcoming artist in Italy, and I usually try to find female artists, because you don't really see them too much in the comic book world. Um, her name is Martina Nuaski, and she is amazing. She's super young. I think she just got out of college, but she is just incredible. I mean, her use of color and her use of lettering, coloring, she does all, all of it. She just, she's just incredible. Looking at yourself as a writer, and of course, being being a writer for comics and writer for film, there's very there's a lot of similarities when it comes to those two styles. I went back to uh, film myself, actually, as a producer and, and all that stuff uh, from an IT field in, of 20 years. So, you know, trying to go from a, a logical side of, of IT to the, the creative side of film is was a rather interesting jaunt as well. But your journey from creating this comic and learning about the stylization of the film as being a director and a writer, what is it that you enjoy about being a writer, especially for this series? I mean, with comic books and script writing, script writing has, they, they're very similar. The elements of comic book writing is that you get to see what you are writing right there on the spot next to like script writing, which you're just kind of like, you're visualizing everything in your head. And I love both because I'm a visionary. So I, I like to have both of uh, both of those worlds next to me. As for script writing, I believe that it kind of constricts you more so than does with comic book writing. Uh, comic book writing, you're not sitting there thinking about budgets and, and, and all these things and settings and making sure that these people can be and, and do the things you want them to do in a particular setting. In comic books, you can do anything. Like, because there's, there's nobody virtually, I mean, there's nobody there. Everybody is just created characters. So it allows you to have the freedom to just build the world. When it comes to this particular script here itself, why did you want to write a dystopian comic? And, and why was it important for you to, to flesh out these characters that you've created? I'm a giant lover of sci-fi horror. I mean, I used to, when I was a kid, my mom and I would watch just countless black and white movies. Um, I mean, it would go from Alfred Hitchcock to 
you would see uh, the old Twilight Zone television show where Star Trek fans, I'm a giant sci-fi, giant sci-fi fan. Um, I love apocalypse stories. I have a love for The Night of the Living Dead. It's one of my first movies I've ever saw. Um, the Walking Dead, I guess recently, like as a giant lover, I love that show as well. Um, the Last of Us video game, yeah. things like that. Um, apocalypse story, I, I guess I feel like it's one of those places where it allows an underdog to become bigger. And it's great to be able to see what, what carriages would do in a very survival situation and how they would how they would elevate themselves to get out of those situations. Interesting. So then what's the most misunderstood aspect about the apocalypse genre that people who don't follow it misunderstand? I think mostly it's, it's character driven. I, I think you have a lot of them that are just like gory for gory's sake, but really good ones. They're pretty much character driven and allow you to see just different sides of humanity. And you don't normally get to see that in, in particularly dramas like action and and drama and, and comedy, but all those things are kind of put together when you have an apocalypse story. So it, it helps you kind of flesh out the world and the characters. Looking at some of the, the more recent apocalypse genres like you just previously mentioned here, what are some that are maybe overlooked because of genres like The Walking Dead? I would think that uh, some series that I saw that were particularly overlooked, I think Invasion is something new that just came out. It's kind of overlooked. And there are some aspects of, I would think, uh, let's see, what's uh, one show that I've been particularly watching not too long ago it was, um, I think it was, it came out right beside The Walking Dead and was really good. I'm trying to remember the show by any chance. <laughs> Uh, I guess I would say, I would probably go back to The Nine of the Living Dead. I think that's a, one that's particularly over. Like, it's a very niche film. There are some people who really know about it, and there's people who don't really know about it. I have friends that hate apocalypse tales and friends that love them. Um, and I think that comes from a span of uh, having some tales that are just particularly just way too gory and not really story driven. You have a lot of the shows that are coming out, Army of the Dead and, and things like that, that are just more so in action. And so I think a lot of people are just like kind of over it. But when you really start to get into aspects of like a character story, like The Walking Dead, mm -hmm. like The Last of Us, I think that kind of brings people back so they can kind of feel what that character feels and actually kind of wonder what they would do in that situation rather than shoot them up action packed. I mean, then you get to some amazing like uh, foreign films like Train to Busan and, and everything like that. That's those true. Types of genres where it's just like you don't know where they can take it. And when they do take it, it's just incredible, especially being a, an adaptation of a manga as well, which is pretty amazing. Exactly. I don't know why I forgot about that. Yeah, I just recently saw that within the last two months. And I don't know why. It's probably because of streaming services and having to buy all blah, blah, blah. But I <laughs> recently got to see it and wow, that's amazing. They had such a great mixture of action and, and drama and they still had the character driven side of it, but it, it wasn't as you know huge as The Walking Dead. It's a movie. It's not able to like stretch out like that, but it had all of it and it was just, it was perfect. And it's, it's amazing to see something foreign coming here and, and doing so well because it, they often don't get seen. So you've already been inundated with, uh, you know, your love of manga or anime or everything like that. So you already know the foreign market as a whole. And it's right, just right. one more one more thing in your media Rolodex to watch. <laughs> exactly. So many things out these days to watch. It's it's hard to, like, get out of the crowd. So trying to – and in, in these days, nothing's really original. So it's a, really about – taking things that have already been done and kind of mixing them together to make it feel original. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think Amelia Sky does that very well. Yeah. So let's talk about Amelia Sky here. So, as you mentioned some of the characters. Is this a one and done series? Are you making this into a trilogy? What is your, what's your game plan for Amelia Sky, especially with the campaign currently ongoing? Well, currently I have about probably eight volumes. So it's a long ongoing series. It's probably going to turn out to be 12 volumes, ultimately. That's about, about seven to eight comic books a piece, each volume. So it'll be pretty big. It has a twist towards the middle of the storyline to where you can see that it's going to open up into something a lot bigger. And what I want to eventually is to take characters that I'm developing on the side 
and join them all together and make it their own universe. I think that at the end of the day, I want to make it an animation and yeah. my love for movies, I want to be able to uh, expound upon that. And I think after this Kickstarter, we'll be looking towards doing more of an animated type of like episode on YouTube or something. So why animation though? I mean, that's, that's a pretty time consuming endeavor. It is. It's, um, it is I, what I've learned in film. Like it's so expensive to do stuff like this, like, and then finding the right people and getting producers, investors, it's such a big project. With animation, it allows me to find a group of people and for them to take that story and just open it up and make it make it what I want it to be. And if it's going to push over towards that world, the movie television world, it's going to get a lot more constricted. And that'll be due to money and finding people and finding locations and things like that. Are you already kind of trying to find the animation studio or people uh, maybe go independent more than anything? Uh... Definitely. If I could do that, that would be awesome. If I could find an independent studio that wants to take it on, that would be perfect too. Um, but as of right now, it's, it's pretty much our group and trying to find a, an amazing animator to take on the project. Like you said, it's going to be a long running series, a large series at that too. So it's not like you don't have the ability to find the, the right style or the right people you're looking for when it comes to putting this, this together in, into animation format. You know, as a writer, what is the most challenging aspect about being a writer? Is it the beginning, the middle, or the end of your process? I think for me, it's more like the middle. But at the beginning, you have such high hopes and uh, aspirations for your story and you're having to I don't know you have to investigate put it all together and in the end of the day create an outline and those things I enjoy doing I enjoy world building it's just the, the particular little nitty-gritty aspects of it all when it comes down to dialogue when you start to get towards the middle that's when you're like wait a minute I gotta I really gotta think about what these characters are saying so that makes it a little bit more difficult the end part is perfect it's great I love ending process of writing when you're you got everything set everything's ready to go and then you're just in the zone and then by then it's just like cake i mean for particular groups of people it's just like cake. but I, I think mostly most difficult part of the process is dialogue making sure that those characters like you can you can feel what they feel and you can empathize with them and it's a really about in my opinion, going out, people watching, seeing how everybody interacts with each other and, and trying to bring that kind of aspect to a, a more grounded situation with the comic book. What's a, a piece of dialogue that you can always go back to that kind of gets your creative juices flowing when it comes to your process? Let's see, uh, there is an issue one. Um, Amelia is talking to another survivor that she found. Her name is Eleanor. And that's probably one of my favorite characters in the series. Um, and they have such a like a mom and daughter aspect to them. And I grew up in a very uh, single parent situation and me and my mom always talk and have these like very interesting dynamic conversations just about life. So I try to bring that over to Amelia and Eleanor. And it's it's one of those things whenever you, you see those two together and they're talking, it reminds me so much of my mom and, and talking to her and just kind of getting advice and how I should approach the world. And that's always been a thing since I was a kid until now. So how do you approach the world? And, and that's, I often do it in an apocalypse kind of form because it's, this these days, it's it's kind of uh, uh, survivalism. And it's really about trying to survive and it's all just a game. And you're trying to make sure that you're stable and you're happy. And, you know, you don't have certain situations you get into where it, uh, it uh, stops that stability. But... <laughs> Yeah, it's really a, a game of survival, just life in general. The campaign is currently ongoing here. This is a, a great series. What tiers do you have and what perks of the campaign do you have that are currently available that people are uh, going to look forward to supporting? We have this awesome uh, variant cover that we're having with um, our past artist, Gwen. It is a wraparound cover. It's, it's beautiful. It could be It could be a poster. But most of the artwork that we have right now could be posters. Um, it's going to be um, this huge 24 by 32. That'll be something that people can get if we reach our goal. Uh, other than that, we have amazing glow in the dark A shirts with a little emblem on it. We have some uh, metal posters coming out with the actual cover. 
we also have little enamel pendants that we're going to be putting into the Kickstarter ultimately that will go out little ways. Let's see. One of the bigger things I want to bring in is Amelia Sky little pop figurines. We had one done maybe a year ago. So we can reach our goal and, and get kind of past that point. I want people to be able to have an option to get that. And it's it's something that I think it's incredible. I love pop figurines, so I can see them in the background. So. <laughs> no, I couldn't tell whatsoever. It just <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah, that's great. I love it. What is the the ultimate goal or what is the the financial goal that you're trying to reach here? And what is the stretch level goal for this uh, first level? Uh, the first level, we're trying to get $5,000. And that seems like a, a large amount for one particular issue. But if you've done comic books before, you know how much you, you have to put into it to be able to get something out of it. So paying your artists, you have to pay them rates. You have to pay them a great rate so they can actually stay on. I mean, there's other aspects to that, but it's mainly in the process of producing the comic, making sure that I pay my artist and making sure I'm paying my editor. And that is what the $5,000 is mainly going for. We're trying to get more than that so we can add on more, more options for the rewards. Um, and then shipping costs. Shipping costs is a main, a main thing here. In America, it's, it's awesome. But when you get into like international stuff, that's when shipping costs start to like really escalate. And so we're trying to find a happy medium for people who aren't in the country to be able to get the comic book. Yeah, I, uh, I'm in Canada. So shipping anything yeah. anywhere is just like $50 to ship a couple of books. What? No, that's that's horrible. Yeah. That's just like, for one book to ship it to, let's say, Australia, it's like huh. 40 bucks. And you're like, oh my God. And it, is, it sucks for them. It's just like, it's no way to bring it down and it's like you're trying to but it's it's unfortunate i was shipping some cookbooks that i created about 12 years ago or so uh comic cookbooks actually uh, it was a project i put together for 60 comic creators and we supported food banks in north america uh, canada and the u.s and so <clears throat> i was shipping books to the philippines and i had to ship them two books at a time <laughs> Oh my God. <laughs> and, and, and it was like $110, I think, for 10 packages or something like that. It was, and it was, a, it was slow mail, it was snail mail to like yeah. my ship. And it's still like 110 bucks just for like 10 packages. I was like, crazy. Yeah. USPS, a, a lot of, a lot of the comic books I, I had to ship out in the past and things after Kickstarter. It's just like, I have to ship it snail mail. Like, I guess it's really the only way. Like, I could ship it. FedEx or something, but then you're talking like hundreds of dollars for just yeah. one, one comic book. That's that's a little ridiculous. So. Yeah, no, no. no, obviously you you want to keep the cost down as much as you can. You want to give a a reasonable amount for the the comic book itself to for them to purchase. So you know, there's a lot of little avenues you're trying to to uh, save as much as you can, but you also want a quality book and people that can flip through it can enjoy it as well too. Exactly. Exactly. Um, I think that we're going to try to do a happy medium. Um, hopefully, hopefully we can bring it down. And if not, then we will try to, to add on some stuff for international readers to be able to be like, okay, I have more things in my packages and I, I feel a little bit better about spending this much on something. Looking at yourself as a writer, when you finally got the script put together and you gave it to your, your amazing artists there, what was the piece of artwork that you got back with that was way better than what you had written in your script? Oh, wow. I think that when I initially saw the first pages of, and I actually, I would say even character concepts from uh, Martina, I was like, this is the way it should go. Um, it took me a while going through like art station and deviant art to find a new artist that would fit this particular storyline. And I wanted it to be something that was, you know, you haven't seen before, something that had soul to it. And Martina had this ability to bring you in to make it feel like it was more like a movie than it was a comic book. And Gwen had this aspect too. Gwen had this ability to show her, depict the characters and the situations, the panels, to where it felt like it was like an art piece. And it had a movie cinematic aspect to it as well. And then I switch over to Martina and she has more of a cinematic aspect to it. All her lines are like crisp and clean and 
and then uh, it's 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 perfect. But I do like both both ways. Both ways are awesome as well. <laughs> I do like the gr- gringy grittiness of Gwen's work, and I also like the very crisp, clean, like in your face um, colors and lines that Martina brings to the table. Nice. Uh, obviously, you wouldn't stick with an artist unless uh, you know they're they're top notch as it is. And I'm glad that you found uh, the amazing artist that you you're currently with now. So I love that. That's that's wonderful to see. Awesome. It's it's great working. I, I have been lucky to be able to find artists that I don't really have to like sit there and nitpick. Like I can give them the script and they bring something back and it's exactly what I think it's going to be. I don't know. If they say that it's a lot about writing, but I think it's a lot about vision so if we're both clicking and we both have a sense of what the storyline is going to be then we can we can come to the table and always usually agree upon everything collaborations are always a wonderful experience to have especially when it comes to this creative process and sometimes when it comes to the uh, a writer artist combo or duo when it comes to something like this communication obviously is a, is a key factor in that respect what flexibility did you both have when it came to working together and putting together this comic? Oh, wow. I gave, or I typically give a lot of flexibility. Uh, I don't like to constrict anyone because I don't like to be constricted. So if they come back to some of, Martina comes back to me with uh, a particular panel, a particular page that isn't quite what the script says or reads out, and she adds on something to where it shows her more of her visual aspect of it, I'm totally fine with that because I, I trust her 100%. 100% of the time, she's, she's right. So I allow for them to have full creative creative uh, tools and use of everything they want to do to be able to produce uh, my stories. Everyone usually asks, what's the wisest piece of advice or what's the most BS piece of advice that you've ever received? But what is the second wisest piece of advice that you've received that has stuck with you in your career? I think that would have to be, huh, uh, it would have to be one of my college professors, instructors at Columbia told me at the beginning that I have to, I have to learn to be able to bring a person in within the first like three sentences. Like, and I think that's such a sound piece of advice because if you don't do that instant in this day and age, we live in kind of an ADHD age. So Many different medias to look at and if you're not captured within the first like 15 minutes you've kind of lost completely your audience yeah. they, don't, they don't care anymore right? i say that because there's so many other things to watch so if you can capture them in 15 minutes then they're yours like i mean given that you have a story that is great down the line but if you can capture them in 15 minutes then you got them and that's one piece of advice that I've always stuck with is to make sure that at the very beginning of my stories, there's something that captures you and it brings you in and keeps your attention. So what's the opening line of your comic then? The opening line of my comic is Amelia waking up in an abandoned, well, the first issue, uh, Amelia, Amelia waking up in an abandoned hotel in New York City and and everything around her is de- pretty much decaying or falling apart. And she has no idea where she, she is, where she is, and she's trying to get herself out of that situation. And that's the very beginning of the storyline. And I feel that that captures the entirety of the story. Like she has no idea what's going on. And she's trying to make, she's trying to understand in her head who she is and how she's going to go about the situation of staying alive. What was an early experience where you learned that language had power? early experience. I think that had to be when I was in high school, I dabbled a little bit and we had an assignment. I think everybody does in high school where we had to make a poem. And I ended up making my first poem in high school. I think it was like seventh or I'm sorry, ninth grade. And I had never like shown anyone any of my work before, or any writing story works or anything to that degree. And I, I had to stand up in class and read my poem out to my, my classmates and my teacher. And they they were all like visually like stunned that I could write that because I'm usually a silent introverted person. And <laughs> way back then I was that. Like now it's a little different than older. But they were all just kind of flabbergasted and stunned. And at the end of it, my teacher was like, that's probably one of the best works I've read in poetry. 
been a long time. And I knew at that point that writing was something that had the power to change the world, really. I mean, you can write one piece of inspirational dialogue that could change anybody's outlook to become a, a doctor or go and become a, a scientist. Books have the power to change everything. I spent so much time in the local library. I thought I was going to be a librarian when I grew up. I ended up going into IT, but that's beside the point. Oh, I don't know. Yes, go to. <laughs> when you get voted most likely to hack the government, even though, you know, you're Canadian, it's, uh, it doesn't quite turn out that way. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> uh, high school aspirations. That weren't mine. They were someone else's. Anyhow. Um, <laughs> What was the first thing that you created in terms of your writing that made you think, yes, I could do this professionally? First, I, I spoke about this with um, my best friend, who's also a part of the team here as well. It was a horror movie because I loved horror so much growing up. And that was in junior high. I wrote this giant full-length feature. And it was kind of like very scream. I knew what you did last summer. And... I knew at that point in time that it was something that I wanted to do. Like, I've always wanted to be a scriptwriter. I wanted to be a scriptwriter since I was probably five. Um, and that started off watching the first uh, Batman movie, 1989 Batman. I went to the theater and I saw that movie and I, I was just like blown away. And I had to sit there for the credits and I wanted to know who wrote that. And I was like, and I found out that, you know, the job, the, the actual profession of scriptwriting at that point in time. And it was like, a, blew my mind. And I just wanted to be able to create worlds like that. And so I created that script when I was in high school, oh, well, junior high. And it was read by a few people who thought it was amazing. And I thought at that point, this is what I really want to do. I mean, I've always wanted to do it. But at that point, it kind of submitted that. What challenges do comic creators or writers face in today's society that makes their professional job a lot more difficult than it should be? Oh, wow. I would say that it's just the amount of content. It's just so much. And to be able to stand out from a crowd. So you could be amazing like and have some of the most amazing work that anybody's ever seen. But there's so many people now doing this particular trying to be a, a writer in comic books or an artist in comic books. And it's so hard to just get yourself out, out there. That's probably the most difficult part about the job. So how do you set yourself apart from the masses and the 8 billion other people in this world? You really have to do it in my opinion. I think that comes a lot with your artist. I think if you have a particular artist with a particular vision and you both can decide upon what that vision is going to be between you guys. I think that if you can find someone that can speak to people, because I'm a visual storyteller at heart as well. And if I see a piece at a museum, uh, a painting, that makes me stop. And there's thousands of paintings around me. That artist has to be really, really amazing. Like it has to have some kind of uniqueness to it. That's, that's, that's telling, that speaks to me. I think that's, a, I think it's finding a, an artist that can, can say your truth while saying their truth. So what's a piece of artwork that makes you stop and stare at it? It will always be uh, Van Gogh. It'll right. always be a circle. Like always. Like I, I can, I have that in my living room right now. It reminds me of when I was younger. And it's just like, you stare at it for hours because it makes you just like imagine what he was thinking when he did it. And just imagine being in that situation because we're all, we all like to sit outside and just take in nature and look at the stars and wonder about things. So that's a perfect piece of me, for me, in my opinion. I live across from Detroit, Michigan. So we have the DIA and the Contemporary Museum of Art and everything like that. So it's not like it's not like New York, but it's still a pretty decent collection. And they have a Caravaggio and a, they had a Van Gogh wing and a Caravaggio wing. And I think Caravaggio to me was just his use of light and shadow and just his stylization of, of everything is just incredible. Like, <laughs> it's just like I learned in film school that light and shadows can make everything. Oh. Like, it's just like, and if you can do that as an artist, like even in comic book form, if you can adapt and be able to hone in your use of light and shadows, you can come up with some really amazing stuff. 
when I went back to school for visual arts, it was actually for visual arts, communication, communication, media, and film. So it was a double major. So visual arts as an actual like painting and photography and fine arts is what it was. And so that was an interesting aspect where you, you learn about color theory and you learn about lighting, you learn about everything like that and, and how that transitioned into film and television and, and visual styling, I think is pretty incredible in that respect that I think a lot of people, even I think writers should understand color theory and, and lighting and shadow in, even before they start their script so that they can understand visually what they're trying to convey. Exactly. And that's, that's pretty much everything. Like if you, your visualization, if you don't have that in your head, then you're just, you, you're lost. And it's going to be a seriously difficult time to finish that story because you don't have a, an idea of what you want. But if you go into it with what you're saying, color theory and some of the basic things that you learn in art school, it, it gives you more of a key to be able to make that story awesome and give you a way to be comfortable and get in the zone of writing it. and that's really what it's all about if you can't get in the zone it's, it's going to be super difficult <laughs> or just watch every single bob ross uh youtube yeah. painting show that he ever did and you'll understand it a lot better as well i'm sure <laughs> that's very much oh yeah i'll sit and watch bob ross every i'm actually doing a, a side painting for myself and i had to sit there and watch what he was doing to be able to kind of duplicate that in the painting that I was doing. And I'm a, I, I like to work with like oil paints yeah. and I do a lot of like sci-fi, like uh, astral uh, uh, painting. So I'll okay. paint like galaxies and stuff like that. It's freeing though. It really is. If you've ever, when we were kids, we used to, to pick up a paintbrush or do whatever and draw and be creative. And then all of a sudden, you know, life decides to say, Hey, you know, you shouldn't be doing this stuff creatively. And, you know, I think you lose a part of yourself, but you, it's good that you can find it back again when you come uh, later in life, uh, especially when it comes to painting or photography or whatever. Yeah, exactly. If you don't, I, I, I would, that would be my piece of advice for, for any writer or creator is to go and take up poetry, to take up uh, painting and all these things, these things can help you in your work and in everyday life as well. But if you can do those things, it helps you, gives you more of an ease to be able to work in writing and become more of a visual storyteller because you kind of, you're, you're opening up your imagination. Because you have a, a long running series, and, and I think you said like eight to twelve issues, something like that, uh, previously a little earlier in the in the campaign. Uh, yeah, I think uh, comic uh, the how they structured. I think a volume is like seven seven issues. So two volumes is like twelve issues all together. I mean, it's it's half of what you're doing in the in the first volume. So to go back and think about it, it's probably going to be around. Um, 12 to 14 volumes it may go a little bit longer than that um, i haven't come to the very end game of everything right now i'm still i guess developing that the, the little intricacies of the storyline and how everybody's going to go but yeah it's going to be a very ongoing long series just means you have to come back a few a few more times throughout the years and uh, and keep promoting it there you know <laughs> <laughs> definitely <laughs> bring your artists back on as well too and uh you know we'll have a, a great conversation about art and stylization of comics in today's world i would love to get her on her <laughs> take on this is going to be quite interesting <laughs> so yeah wonderful is there a comic that made you feel the way you hoped readers of your work would feel after reading it i am i got a giant lover of the walking dead i i like issue one it's one of those things where it places you in a world that you have no idea about. I mean, you you know it's a zombie apocalypse, but it's actually more of a character-driven storyline. And you're, you're placed in the lead character's, uh, in his head, Rick Grimes. And from there, you're just traversing the environment, trying to figure out what's going on. He's trying to find his family. And that's something that speaks to everyone. Like. You lose a family member in everyday life. You lose a friend in everyday life, and you're struggling with why that happened and your situation around you. And I think that captured that so amazingly in the first issue. And it kept responding upon that throughout the, the series. But um, I tried to bring that to Amelia Sky, the first issue. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? 
one person that inspired me along my path. I, I, I think not to sound too cheesy, it would probably be my mom. Like, so there are times in my life where I feel like I lose my drive and I want to give up. And there's, that's just for any writer, for any artist. But she's always been that one person to tell me to get up and, and keep moving and to never quit. And so I've always had that stuck in my head. That's been something that's uh, been a mantra since I was a child that she's always taught me. And that's one thing I'll never, I'll never stop doing is giving up. And from a professional standpoint, you've created an amazing comic. You are going to be creating more comics and maybe an animated series in the far future. But for now, you've created an amazing comic series. And so professionally, you're successful in that regard. Do you consider yourself personally successful? To a certain degree. Uh, I, I always look at my success as a, around how many people I can inspire. And so far with the comic book, we've inspired a, a several hundreds, but I would like that to be several thousands. I like to be several millions. If I can inspire, I, my, my initial thought with Amelia Sky was to create it for groups of younger, our target, target audience is for groups of younger women who don't often get into this genre. And to be able to see a story being told that is specifically pretty much all women. Like there's a, not to give too much away about the storyline, but inside of the world of Amelia Sky, all the men have died off and the, they've been eaten by the, the antagonists, the Shriekers. So now you have a setting to where there are a few men left in the world and it's primarily, it's primarily populated with, with women. So I, I want to be able to, I want it to be able to always have like a, something, that, a message within any of my stories. And I often think uh, that most stories about women go undertold. And now we're seeing a, a progression in, in, this, uh, in this life, in this world, that we see women are starting to become more directors and more writers. And it's amazing. And we're actually seeing different stories. We're not seeing the same old stories told from the aspects of a male character. We get to see something different here. And yeah, no, no, that, that would be my answer to that. <laughs> The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? I deal with my failures by taking a, a close magnifying glass to each and one of them um, to try to see them in more of an aspect of not really of a, a failure, more of a more of a path to get better. And I like to progress on the things that I am very much not very good at. Um, like, so when I first started, dialogue was always an issue. I think that's for every writer, but sitting down and, and, and going out in, in your world and listening to people and just like sitting back and watching their movements and not to sound weird or anything, but I think that's all what writers do and all what artists do is to be able to take from their environment and try to make their own work better. And I think that through time, I've, I've been able to do this. Through my intros, introspective world here, I've been able to get out and make sure that I, I, I take in the sights, take in people's opinions, take in people's thoughts and dreams, and try to bring that over to my writing. The younger generation is looking at your work, and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, whether it's as a writer or maybe a, possibly a director based off of your scripts or comic creator animation mogul in the future uh, and maybe even inspire them in some way shape or form how can they inspire the generation that follows them i think they will be able to inspire them and that's going to be through just having to their own struggles i think everyone has the ability to i guess to say their own pain some people try to keep that closed in and tight knit to themselves. But I think through pain is through learning and, and happiness and, and ins inspiration. And if people can open up and tell others what's happening in their lives, I think that through pain comes, comes happiness. Like through pain, you can really empathize with people. And 
I think a lot of the people that we have in now, the artists, if they can capture that, if they can tell their truth and tell how they got there, their struggle, I think that inspires everyone and inspires your young uh, upcoming writer to be able to go, okay, that person went through similar things that I went through. And, and I want to be able to take from them and expound upon that and become better. And I think that's what really needs to happen with this generation to allow others to visualize their struggle. If your life was a comic book or a film, what would its title be? And what would its soundtrack be? Ooh, let's see. I am currently developing another story. It's, <laughs> uh, it's about <laughs> alternate dimensions. It would be, it's called Multi-D. And I think that is a good aspect of my life it's just telling because it's it's i'm not only just a writer like there's multi facets to my my work and my personality it's multi-dimensional and i try to bring all those things together to make something that you the reader can relate to well that just means another interview uh, down the road once you get that in the can you know we'll uh, we'll get you back on for something like that as well too but Jermaine I do hate to say it, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking I want to thank you so much for coming on the show oh, thank you so much for having me this has been awesome I love talking about writing and television movies it's it, it always gets my eyes glistening. <laughs> Before I let you go, where can we find you? How can we support you? Of course, where is this amazing campaign and anything else you'd like to promote? Uh, yeah, that's going to be uh, on Kickstarter on October 10th. You can always go on to Facebook, go on to Instagram, go on to Twitter or X and, and find uh, Amelia Sky. You'll find it under Prismication Studios. It's a, it's a publishing uh company that I'm trying to start self-publishing that's going to bring in all of my stories together. You can definitely, I would love for everyone to go to the Kickstarter on October 10th and uh, support us. Um, I'm going to try to bring in some other, tell some other stories that I'm actually trying to produce as well during the campaign, like multi-dimensional. And there's certain stories, uh, the remains that has a lot to do with Amelia Sky. It's a side story. I want to actually start trying to publish soon but promote that's what i meant to say within the campaign well like i said that ends this particular episode of two geeks talking you can of course find this interview and a thousand plus others on our website tgtmedia.com or two geeks talking.com that's t-w-o not the number two of course the website's going through a revamp as it always has been you can of course find all of these interviews on our youtube channel because that's a lot more updated it's just youtube.com forward slash tgt media the podcast is back after 12 or so years you can find that at two geeks talking.podbean.com or just search for two geeks talking wherever you get your podcasts and as i say every week everyone has a story to tell it's up to me to help bring that out thanks for listening and watching on two geeks talking